This is, is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? I was going to check, but we're live. We're live. Oh, my God, we're live. We're Holy live. Holy crap. Who did that? Oh, my God, we're having a fire sale. Boom. <laughs> What's that from? It sounds oh. familiar. It sounds was, like you're the announcer in Warzone right now. That was just a sympathy laugh then. Yeah, it was. It's from Arrested Development. I never watched it a lot. I liked what I saw. I just never got into it, into it. Okay, well. It was the same thing as The Office. I watched one episode of Arrested Development on TV, but like had no context. And same with The Office. And I was like, this is the stupidest show ever. But if you watch it and you follow from the beginning, it makes a whole lot more sense and it's much easier to get into. <laughs> I've seen enough to like understand. And also their yeah. cast alone, like Jason Bateman, Will Arnett, and I can't remember her name, Mallory Archer from Archer. You know, the mom. I forget her name away. too. Yeah. yeah. Well, not just, but recently. How much could a banana possibly on. cost? $10? <laughs> It's, I saw a chart once that linked all the references in that show, and they're just so deep. I've probably watched it through like four or five times, and I still like catch something new every time. It's like the smartest humor. So I good. love it. So check it out again. Do it. I will. I've seen The Office probably 10 times through, not by choice, but I've seen Westworld four or five times through. So I'm down for a four Did or you five see there? They're yeah. like taking down Westworld now? Well, they canceled the next season, which, I mean, honestly. Oh, well, yeah. But they no. took it off HBO. I know a lot of that's stuff what, is like shaking up at HBO right now. Yeah, that's what I was seeing. Because it was like that last season just came out and then it's like not going to be on there anymore or something. I don't know. I'm getting confused now because I think we have a Showtime subscription, but you can subscribe to Showtime through like every freaking service. Yeah, yeah. So like... <laughs> I'm like, oh, that thing was on Showtime that I was going to watch. And then it's like, log into Prime. No, we don't have Showtime on here. Is it on HBO Max? Is it on whatever? And I'm like, this is awful. Showtime should be like automatically available or tied to all of those accounts so I can use any of them. But no, it's billed on one of them and I can only use it there. It's insane. When the new season of Dexter came out, I just went direct to Showtime. Direct uh, to the smart. Pirate Bay? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, don't tell everyone. I had to get YouTube TV recently to watch a show that I wanted to watch. And number uh, one, YouTube TV is not cheap. And no, it's I, not. I'm like, okay, I'm just waiting for this show to end so I can cancel this subscription. Number two... You forgot YouTube, to cancel it. I didn't forget the sh show is still going. I just... YouTube, it's actually The show really goes on nice. forever, so you got to pay for it forever. Yeah, honestly. They've got me <laughs> hooked. So, like, I'm willing to pay so that I don't have to, like, wake up every Monday morning and log into a, a name site and <laughs> download a less clear picture. Yeah, we, it's like the people who would go into the movie theaters with the camera. And oh, then my God. The audio is awful unless... The person sat in the handicap accessible seat and plugged in their headphone jack into that. Oh. The worst part about those people pirating stuff in the theater was like the audio made it unbearable. And yeah. then somebody figured that out and it's like, well, it still looks like crap, but you can like at least enjoy the audio. Probably. Did I know anything about this, by the way? I never said the show. I'm going to say it because or else people are, I'm watching Yellowstone and I am hooked in the veins hooked. My parents oh. were watching that when I was so visiting good. them last and I really was getting into it and then I oh, yeah. forgot all about it. So I'll have to I'll have to watch that sometime. It's the most popular TV good. show in America. Really? I have like a cowboy fantasy I always have. So it's just up my alley. I watched Where, like all four, the first four seasons in like three days. That's why you're such a cowboy coder. Yeah, yeah. exactly. There's a lot to unpack from that statement. First, where's the data that is the most popular TV show in America? Um, Just said it. That's the, the data. Internet. He's the source. <laughs> I we read it on Reddit, so it's, it's <laughs> gospel. I think like they use Nielsen ratings or whatever to determine that in the United States. Um, Still. This is a good segue Who is into Mr. a conversation Nielsen? we had yesterday during a, an incident at work. 
Yes. So we were bamboozled. In the United States, if a fellow American says Southerner, they're talking about the Southern United States. But does that context apply when we say Southerner and we're talking to people globally? South Equator. Right. Or Southern in their South, country. South Hemispherians. Yep, but we conferred with someone in Brazil, and it sounds like their South is not too dissimilar from our South. Exactly. In the context of Brazil. Yes. So, so, so we, far, it works out 100% for me. Andrew no one also, has told me differently yet. Andrew also, in the middle of this incident, said, did you know that an adult human hand can fit inside an eagle's talon? And then proceeded to send us a picture of this, which looked photoshopped. Because Jason didn't believe me. He just doubted me. And Jason's like, I don't believe you. That Okay, you could argue but, that I shouldn't have brought it up in the first place. But here we are. Jason's like, there's no way I don't believe you. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to go find it on Reddit. And I showed him and he's like, oh, that's fake. Fake news. Then we took it to chat GPT-3 to get yes. the source of truth. and it Which we said, understood differently. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's that. But it started by saying it is unlikely that a adult human hand could fit inside an eagle's talon. And then Andrew, it proceeds to then explain why. And Andrew's takeaway was it's possible, but you shouldn't do it. But that's not what it said. It said it's unlikely that it would. No, it was saying that it's unlikely a human would put their hand inside of an eagle's talon because the eagle would just bite it off with its razor sharp it dinosaur teeth. It was unlikely that it would fit. I don't know if I saw the word fit. That's literally the question I asked it. You and the person in the mirror are gaslighting me a lot these days. Oh my God. Oh, you <laughs> are. I, I showed you though, the I eagle though. Anymore. Eagles have huge talons. That's all I'm saying. Go look it up, people. Some of them are huge. All right. And yeah. watching eagles fight is... On that note... <laughs> Hold on. How many eagles have you seen fight? I would love watching nature documentaries, dude. David Attenborough. I wish he was my grandfather. Andrew, tell us something terrible you did with code this week. No. <laughs> <laughs> I made a serverless function on Vercel with Ruby and it worked. And then I rewrote it in Sinatra just to see if it would work and it worked. So then I put it back into Vercel and it still worked. And now I have the project 90% done and my brain is not interested in the final 10%. Okay, so where did you land on this? Because you did that ninety percent three times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> See, you're starting to pick up on something, right? This is not the only place I've done this. Give us one example of another time you've done something three times. I have rewritten my website in the past six well, months at I least did, five times. Yeah, I was gonna say I didn't ask for a twenty timer. I asked for oh, three times. Okay, I rewrote my VS Code settings from scratch three times. No, actually, I've probably done that more than From three times. scratch? Yeah, I like deleting them and just starting over. I really need help. This is Chris, help. Chris, tell us what you did with code this week. I don't know. That's a good question. I've been to the airport at 4.30 in the morning multiple times this week. So, like, this week's kind of a blur. Or are you saying everything you did with code was... Yeah, I mean, it could be, yeah. I guess the borderline one here is having to actually physically print a PDF to debug and see if something was fixed. That's a first for me in however many years of programming. Renders perfectly on the computer, but somewhere in that, you know, what you would expect, the PDF rendering in your computer, that somehow just gets rasterized and sent to the printer, you would think. But no. Yeah, apparently that does not. That's a cool word. word. I know I've done a lot of PDF printing to printers to run, see if it looked right, and it didn't. And I've had to do that a lot. I used to work at a company that did a lot of printing, so I've done a lot Kinkos. of work with printers. Yeah, FedEx Kinkos. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that worked fine. Yeah. I was actually a UPS driver, but... Wait, why would you have to do printing as a UPS driver? Because that's how I got my routes for the day, because I don't use technology mm. in my former life. I am just glad to hear other people have printers because I got roasted yeah. at work one day because I had a printer like I was I some boomer. 
I like always have to print something around tax season. It's like a guaranteed thing that I've got to do that at least once a year. So other than that, honestly, don't use it hardly ever, but scanning stuff in is an occasional thing as well. You get some tax paperwork, scan it in, whatever. You were making it sound thrilling. The only reason I use it (laughs) is around taxes, which are not the most fun thing. They are not. Did you get your rasterization issue solved? Yes and no. I fixed it by just switching from the OTF font format to the TTF font format, which is like the most compatible one, I guess. The true type? Yeah. Yeah, So I don't remember what the OTF stands for. Open type? It might be, actually. Open type foundry? I was trying to think of the opposite of true, the false type. I search for OTF meaning and it says only the family. So mm, only the fans. Oh, only the fans. <laughs> it's I open. Called it. It's open. Fix it yourself. That's what it means. <laughs> it's open so, source. Yeah. So yeah, like I just switched the thing, but it doesn't really fix the issue. So I tweeted about it because the basically like, well, fun things that you don't know about PDFs, they don't support UTF eight by default or whatever. So you got to supply your own fonts. Then if you do that, you got to make sure you got the A font that supports all the characters you want and yada, yada, yada. And I'm we're using prawn for doing PDF. So added a font to fix special characters. Then it fixes that until you print it on the printer. And then you find out that it's just garbage. So we've talked to Cameron Dutro before on a previous episode. I happened to be like looking through the TT Funk gem to see what font types were supported and stuff. And I saw his avatar and some commits and stuff. And that's like the prawn gem that handles fonts. So that had support for OTFs, thought it completely worked. It's a fairly more recent feature that was added. So apparently there's still a little bug there or so. I have a feeling he will get that fixed fairly soon. He was like, yeah, I added that feature. So I guess it wasn't fully finished or complete. But the easy thing is just find a different format of the font. Not the worst thing in the world, but I don't know a lot about fonts themselves, like the internals of all of that and how they work. I just download the font, double click it, install it on my desktop and I'm done. So that's about it. Or the nonsense of like serving them up in CSS imports and all that crap. Subsetting the fonts. That's what I do. Yeah. Fun stuff. But the only way to actually test and see if your fix worked was to print stuff out. So I'd like print it and then go take that piece of paper, see if it printed right. Then put it back in on the top of the stack and like rotate it. So it would print on the front and the back and then the like bottom of the front and the bottom of the back just to not waste paper, (laughs) just to debug. Yeah, that was an interesting situation that I haven't run into before. Lots of tables. Lots of tables. Printers were a lot better back in the day where you had to tear the little nubs off the The side. The matrix. And they like had their own built-in soundtrack, basically. My dad's computer system at work was using dot matrix printers until like three years ago. And when I was a kid, <laughs> yeah, things were oh. really slow in the automotive <laughs> part three building industry. And my job as a kid was to like shred those dot matrix papers. And the shredder was probably from like the seventies. It's amazing. I didn't like physically harm myself trying to shred that stuff, but I have <laughs> fond memories of those green oh. and white papers. When I learned to code, it was on this old Magnavox computer that ran DOS and we had a dot matrix printer and stuff. And I remember just like, this is the coolest thing. Then it was like, well, what the heck do I need to print? So I fiddled with it for a bit and that was about it. (laughs) When I learned to code, jQuery ruled them all. And I learned to code in 2022. I'm (laughs) saying jQuery is still Bay. So we are doing a thing called Tech the Halls. Where for the last two weeks of the year, because we're off between Christmas and New Year's, we are making some minor improvements to the app at Podia. I 
finally got to go back to my removing webpacker work that I started two months ago. Hey. And it only took a day to get everything because I only had JavaScript left. It only took a day to move everything. Isn't that over. how it goes? You like put a project down because you're like, oh, we'll never finish this. And then you come back to it two months later and it's a day's worth of work. And you're like, yep. we could have just done that two months ago. <laughs> the problem is we still have a very small set of pages relying on our old assets. So like we have some JavaScript in the asset pipeline still. jQuery. So one of the problems I had was that one of our major pages left still used jQuery UJS. And so I couldn't just abandon it. But then when I tried to like, oh, we'll use Rails UJS, you can't use them if they're both loaded. I had to rewrite that page before I left for my sabbatical so that when I came back, I could remove the jQuery UJS dependency. But mm-hmm. I did that. I had a couple of interesting things I ran into. So we're using ES build and there's a stimulus importing plugin for ES build. So instead of having to manually import each controller, basically like what the Webpack helper did where it can just like traverse a folder and load all the controllers. And that was okay, except I had to figure out how to load multiple folders that live side by side, but not all of them. So I just used that plugin import three times and alias the definitions. And then I was able to say like dot concat, dot concat, and just concat them all together. And that works. Okay. Stimulus works. And then we use React Rails. It's in the React repository on GitHub. React has a React Rails gem and they have a like React Rails UJS thing to actually like load in the components so that in the Rails side, you can be like render React component and just give it the name of the component. And that also broke. This is where it got messy. I had to bring in a glob import plugin. I had to glob them, but then also loop through all the path names and remove the prefix in front of it, like where it actually was, because the React Rails GM expects just the name of the component, not the folder structure leading up to it. And then I had to overwrite the constructor to understand how to do that. Most of this was on an issue, I think, maybe even in the gym. But once we got that pattern down, like it was kind of just, we have a couple of what were packs, which are now entries for us. And so it was just copy and pasting that code and changing the function, the like what folder structure it was. But I mean, we did all that in a day and there are a couple other little things. We magically imported icons on the fly in certain components. We couldn't do that anymore. I built an object where each key was like the name that we were sending from the props and the right hand side of it was the actual file, like where it is. Basically, any file we could possibly use, I kind of had to build like a little mini dictionary for it instead of just like importing on the fly. We had to explicitly import all of them. But I feel like that was the three biggest things. And we have a lot of JavaScript. So the fact that we were able to ship it so quickly, I was really happy with. (laughs) Three months, but one day really for most of it was pretty good. Hi, my name is Andrew Mason, and I'd like to tell you about Honey Badger. Whether USDS1 is down or you forget to add a configuration file, Everyone has an outage from time to time. When your next outage occurs, transparency is critical. The difference between a minor annoyance that people soon forget and a fiasco that creates sustained resentment is how you communicate. That's why you need Honey Badger. Honey Badger is a crucial component of your incident response plan with their uptime monitoring service that now has an exciting new feature, public status pages. Create a new status page with custom domains, branding, and more. Don't let Twitter be the only way your users can find out if your app's down. Sign up for Honey Badger to improve your incident response with a shiny new status page that you'll be proud to show users. Visit honeybadger.io and start giving your users a better experience today. Let them know that Remote Ruby and specifically Andrew Mason sent you. I did the same thing with the stimulus imports and stuff and then made the ES build Rails node module. So if anybody wants to like oh, cool. just grab something and have that done, that's what we use in Jumpstart Pro and everything. It just... It'll go in namespace stuff as well. So if you're importing stimulus controllers folder with several folders below, it should handle all that properly for you. And then you just like 
I forget. It's in the readme. Like you just loop through and register your controllers and you're good to go. But yeah, that is a pain. You reminded me of, uh, they pulled over the confirm modal to turbo, but they don't have support for the disable with stuff anymore. I don't think that got moved over. And like you could use the stimulus controller for it, but it was very convenient just to have right. it automatically done for you. That's one thing that I wish would get figured out and handled. And that old stuff could just be changed ideally to data confirm and data disable with to data turbo confirm and data turbo disable with. But I know there's some discussion about like, do these really belong in turbo or not? And to me, Turbo's already handling the link navigations and the form submissions, then yes. That was the whole purpose of the disable with and confirms anyways. So if the tool is going to be doing the navigation stuff, it seems like it makes sense to have that done. But I haven't looked for a while to see if any drop-in stimulus controller replacement or anything was done for that somebody had maybe shared or whatever. But I think that was like the one last thing I was like really... I can get rid of them or ignore them for now or whatever. Like they aren't the worst thing in the world, but it's nice to have the button disable while the form is processing. And if you can make it really simple and easy, that's great. I've had to write so much JavaScript to disable freaking buttons in the past month. So I completely (laughs) even forgot that used to be a thing. And I'm like, oh, we just always lived in this hell where I write JavaScript to disable all these buttons over and over This is more generic use case because we're talking about like submitting specifically, but there is also some functionality. We use at Podia now where we're actually looking at like form validity and using CSS will disable buttons if a form's not valid. Like if a field's required and then it's, there's no content in it, then the button's just disabled. And that's, I know this is a different thing, but that's something I've really enjoyed is it's just a nice little touch that I really like. And I'm in this kind of deep thought cycle of like, I think a lot about the front end right now. And I'm really mad at the front end. So anything... You mad, bro? I'm mad. I'm, you big I'm, mad? I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated <laughs> that all the cool stuff happening in front end is mostly happening in React and Vue and projects like that. And that... Oh. While you were talking, I was just searching the issues about this, the form disable stuff. I forgot that Sean Doyle had made a PR that's actually really freaking cool. So you make a button with two spans inside of it and Turbo will automatically add the disabled attribute to the button when it's submitted or whatever. So then you have just CSS swapping which is visible instead. So it will automatically take care of it for you. But there's, of course, now a button instead of an input element, which is, I believe, required in order to do this because an input isn't going to support HTML inside. Then you've got to have these two different spans that you put inside of your button, which you've got to then have some way of generating that. Maybe you build yourself a helper for it or whatever, but it's going to be a little bit more annoying than disable with and a little data attribute there, but it is possible. I did forget that. I don't know that it works on links or whatever, but I don't know that I ever really used it on links, mostly just form buttons, but sorry, I'm with you. The front end is a hundred percent the hardest part right now of anything we build. And Turbo is getting a lot more complete finally, which is good. But, you know, it just feels like the thing you always have to think about, how do we solve these problems instead of like, there's a pattern available that we just follow. And Turbo is only a slice of the problem to me. It helps Turbo and things like HTMX that build these ways to do the kind of the reactivity part. But even still... One thing that was really cool about, I guess it's still really cool, but one thing that's really cool about Bootstrap is you didn't have to think. Once you learned the system, you just used it. And why are you shaking your head? I'm so triggered. That is not true. No. If you are in your play app or your personal side project, sure. In a production app, I have worked with Bootstrap for the majority of my career. And I can tell you right now, it is not 
just slapping button tags everywhere once you get at that scale. Why not? Because it becomes this disaster where you have to try to override things because someone before you tried to override things and now you're overriding more things. And so that doesn't and the, sound like bootstrap. And you have to have your bootstrap classes in a very specific way. And if they're not in that very specific way, then the things are not going to work. So when you try to wrap certain things in turbo frames, all of a sudden your CSS doesn't work for drop downs and things like that. So that doesn't sound like a fault of bootstrap. Like that sounds like a fault of someone trying to override bootstrap. No, I'm sorry. It's not Bootstrap's fault. It's when used, I often find that happening. So I'm zooming out a little bit because like, yes, like we use Bootstrap at Podia and it causes trouble even at Podia because Bootstrap, it's so, Bootstrap itself doesn't have everything we need. Bootstrap's just an example though. Like if you work in that design system and you stay there, you get a lot of functionality for free. Yes. Tailwind UI is really awesome. Like it makes things look good, but in terms of interactivity, if you're not using Reactor View, which a lot of us who are using Tailwind UI in Rails are probably using it mostly on side projects, are not using React and View. I had a talk with Chris the other day, like whenever I see requires JS and Tailwind UI, I'm like, oh, because I don't want to spend the time to build as complete of an interactive component as they've spent. You ever looked at headless UI, like keyboard navigation works really well. It's accessibility friendly. So I don't know. I'm just frustrated writing front end code. And Alpine components. Alpine components help. They yeah, do. that's what I was going to say. The nice part about Alpine is you're not creating a separate JavaScript file and trying to keep everything in sync. You're just one place and all of that's there together. But then another library you got to deal with too. Yeah, I like Alpine. I freaking love talking to Caleb. Something's just missing for me still. I think it frustrates me like when I looked at there's 50 different React UI libraries have every component you could need and props to customize them. And then you don't think about it. You just build these interfaces with React, but it comes with a bunch of other trade-offs like build tooling. And when something doesn't go exactly how it should, you got to like get into the depths. So maybe it's not a solvable problem, but it's frustrating me and I'm, my patience for it's getting thin. Yeah, it's not easy. What? That would fix it. TypeScript? Yeah. Prototype.js. Ah. Let's go back in time. Okay. Backbone? When... Yeah, when things were easier. Member, the member berries. Remember when we just had jQuery? <laughs> yes. Remember when there was just the CDN? Yes. Member. I mean, building UIs wasn't great back then either. Maybe that's the trick. We just have to be okay with shitty UIs. Honestly, Maybe. I've been advocating for that for a long time. It's like whenever someone hands me a really complex UI interaction, I'm like, what if we just showed a JavaScript alert and called it a day? <laughs> well, <laughs> there is a part of me, it's my annoying like perfectionist side that I've just never been happy with the UI I've written. I've, I've never been happy with the UI you write either. Yeah, I have no one has. always <laughs> been angry at the UI actually. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. I get a deep satisfaction from writing Ruby and Rails and I don't know, it scratches an itch and I feel a lot more proud of what I write there. Maybe I'm just a shitty UI developer. Maybe that you is the problem. might just need to consult a doctor Maybe. if you've had this itch for more than four hours. <laughs> it sounds like you're just a back-end engineer who like wants to be better at front-end development but can't spend ultimately the amount of time that is required to like intimately be in that space. So you just have to jump in when you need to. And because of that, you only have this certain level of knowledge and it's frustrating because then you Maybe. go back to where you're happy and used to and comfortable and you're like, well, things are always better here. Yeah, but yeah, why can't we have both? But, you know, Caleb's probably one of the people who are the most efficient at building the UI components and stuff like on the front end. And the amount of like nuance to all of it, getting that right, like to use these things you don't even realize all of those details that were done to make it work smoothly with the animations, getting timed right, and keyboard, and everything else that goes to it. 
So when you like use it, you're like, oh, this feels great. And you don't realize that was a week's worth of work to build this one little widget. And on the back end, we're like so efficient in building a lot of complex things. It really feels like you get slowed down in the front end because it is much more tedious work. And I don't know that there's necessarily a way to solve that. That's React and Alpine and Vue and all these different tools are trying to solve that, but they haven't really made it as efficient as like our backend stuff. I think React has done a good job or people in the React community have done a good job. I just think it comes with a cost I'm not willing to pay of supporting that type of build tooling and that type of trade-off. Maybe that's it. Maybe I just need to use Alpine. Maybe you give it a shot and see what happens. Maybe that just needs to be a week or two of, hey, let's go build the stuff and see if you actually feel any better. Maybe you won't. Well, I'm just going to write Ruby. And speaking of Ruby, we started to, as part of Tech the Halls, also rename some models that have changed their domain naming in the last couple of years. So when we used to allow you to send newsletters, which we have renamed within the company as broadcast, we allow you to send campaigns, which are emails that drip out. So therefore they used to be called a drip sequence in our app. And they have associations and also belong to other things. And we're finally like, oh, we should rename them. And yikes. We also have things like we used to call our memberships, memberships, now they're communities. So someone else is working on that part. So Andrea and I thought, oh, we'll just like pick up renaming. What was it like? Trip email to campaign email. And then that was like 60 or 80 files changed, something like that. But one of the things we ran into is actually something my coworker Harry messaged me about earlier that day. So we're leaving the tables in the database, the same name right now. That has nothing to do with it, but it is context. It might be worth it. So like the campaign email is still called drip emails in the table. We just say self.table name in the model. And so if you have a campaign has many campaign emails and you're not updating the name of the association. So a campaign still has many drip emails, but you've renamed it to be campaign email. If you don't set inverse of yep. on that association, it'll know how to build one. So if I said like campaign dot drip emails dot build, it would build it, but it would lose the association. Because even infer it from the model name instead of yep. the table name. There's no foreign key yet. Like it can't go look in the database. So it just creates like an in memory reference. And so like test started failing because that was nil. It was such a subtle thing. And we encountered that because active record will automatically infer the inverse of like, that's just the thing that happens behind the scenes. So yeah, we had to set that and that fixed it. But that was the thing I've always heard about inverse of, but I've never actually had to use inverse of until mm -hmm. this week. It was fascinating. Yeah. And if you use the inverse of, that uses the association name to generate the like drip campaign ID or whatever the parent model. And you can override the foreign key, which is what we were doing. And so it worked. Yeah. It worked with actual like records stored in the database. It was able to find those. But when it actually came to. Right. Because that only affects the actual query portion of it, not the assigning new attributes and association right. stuff. Yeah, you don't think about that because it's so automatic 99% of the time. But when you're doing these things and you want to preserve the database columns as is, because that could be a maintenance task, a burden to run maybe at night or something that you have to do that, or you have to run two columns or something and transfer stuff over right to the new one. And it ends up getting like a lot more work than you expect, but the regular Rails path is like, sick, this is so easy, like voila, we're done. And then yeah. you went off the rails, bro. I did. Yeah, it's fascinating. And it's in the docs. You can just go find it. They have a really good example. Huh. <laughs> I've been thinking of that. So the way I like, Harry and I traced it down, I was like, oh, we'll just bundle open Rails and pry in and all these like points in active record to find out 
where it was. And once we, which option that's using. Yeah. Yeah. And then when it's like, okay, like this reflection type is nil, but if we set it back to what it was before, like we recheck out main, there's actually like a reflection type here that is the association it should belong to. And it's like, okay, now we know why. And so if you've never bundled open and just pried in, it's my secret sauce. It's maybe a trash way, but it works. Oh, it works great. And it teaches you about how Rails works internally, I think, which is yeah. going to give you the most tools in your tool bag in, for the future. Like you'll fix this problem, but three years from now and you end up renaming something else and you're like, oh, what the hell did we do last time? You'll remember we need to go look at these parts of Rails because that's where it was. And you may not know exactly what the option was you had to specify or whatever, but you know how to find it. That's the real trick that you learn there. Am I the only one who reads those options for the associations? And there's like as an inverse of and several other things. I always read the docs and I'm like, what the hell does this mean? It's never super clear. Like, do I use this one or that one? And then am I doing it right? I always like when I end up doing something complex like this, I like have to try a few things and then run it in the Rails console and just confirm it works. Because for some reason, the naming of some of those options and the descriptions of them is just not crystal clear to me when I read it. It's confusing. Some of those things, if you know a lot about databases and associations and things, like maybe you do just understand. But a lot of times I feel like I don't understand those types of things until I encounter them. And even then, I still don't necessarily understand it. But... Once you encounter it more than once, then it starts to click. So I maybe still don't even fully understand inverse of. Maybe I need to encounter it more. You'll end up starting to maintain active record for us, and then you'll finally understand it. Yeah, that'll be it. <laughs> and then I'll go write jQuery. That'll be my escape hatch. On the back end? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Where is jQuery for Node? That's all I'm saying. Yes. So Server-side right jQuery. In query. Better get that no repo query. name. That's all I've got. I think that bundle opening a gem should be the encouraged way to debug. Honestly, it's not as easy the more junior you are. But it, like Chris said, it gets you more exposure to like what's happening underneath. And I think like just reading something, you find a blog post and you're like, oh, copy paste, like this works now, perfect. And you don't actually learn you learned what the issue is. The issue is that the key for this was not correct. And so now you intimately know more about active record and intimately know more about Rails. And like Chris said, you know where to go find that. Yeah, I would highly recommend if you're not using bundle open, definitely maybe try it the next time you encounter an issue and see what Rails is doing under the hood or see what that gem is doing under the hood. And I don't know, it can also help you maybe solve the problem a lot quicker. If you can quit accurately identify what yeah. the problem is. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you really are forced into. This is what the heck is actually happening versus you read the docs and you're like, maybe this applies. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Hopefully I'll find something that's actually as accurate to what's going on. And I just wanted to mention too, like when you were talking about how it's hard for juniors, what's nice is if you can step through the code line by line though. So if you put in your binding IRB, the second you call some library line or your association or something, if you can step through that and then look at all the instance variables and local variables that are actually inside of Rails or whatever library it is, you can then run them line by line and you see like, oh, it took this association, it looked for this relation name out of that, then it converted that from a symbol to a string, then it looked in the attributes for it or whatever. You start to like piece it all together. And if you're just copying what Rails was going to run or the library is going to run line by line yourself, then you get to inspect every step and see this is what it's doing. And it goes down this branch and we can ignore all this code because it hit this if statement and we're not going to have to deal with the else or whatever. And you like start to piece together the exact little steps along the way instead of going from like here straight to the error 
And that's a big leap because that could have made 100 function calls or something in between then. If you are a junior trying to do this, copy paste every line of code, then follow it along in the actual source and you'll like have a much better understanding of it and it won't be that scary. My cat's having a little soccer game over here. I was say, there's a World Cup going on behind you. What yeah. are you doing? He loves his ping pong balls. Same. Yeah. All right. See you next week. All right. <laughs>